Yes. Uh, so before I get started, I, first of all, I'd like to thank you all for coming out. I'm really happy to see you here. Uh, but I've got to give a few shout outs to people. The first one is to my wife for putting up with me. But, uh, this took hours and hours and hours of writing and research. And uh, she was really patient with right, kind of understanding that, that this was something I had to do. And uh, I have two other dear friends, the Goys in the background, and they were, uh, there was a dinner party and I was writing and, and I felt really, really torn. Like I just felt I had to, to, to kind of crank it out in the summer. The summer is really the only time I could, I could spend 10 or 12 hours of writing and researching. So I, I thank them and I thank you all for, for coming out. So, and then two other people, uh, hopefully they're going to show up. Uh, Jorge, who actually formatted the book, right, helped me put it together, right, uh, sent it off to the publisher and everything. Uh, that was a really great help. And then I am not a good editor. So this Michael Whalen, who's a, a friend from the neighborhood and a local poet, was patient enough to go through my text and pick out the, the many sort of, of, of little flaws. Right. So hopefully now it's perfect. But uh, oops, let's start. Uh, so it's funny. Uh, I was I had a completely different idea for the cover. Uh, I was going to put a picture of the refinery on the cover. And then I started to think about uh, about the colors, what colors I wanted. And I said, well, why don't I do it like a, a, a sort of a, a, a mock sugar uh, sugar bag? And hopefully Domino won't, sh won't sue me. <laughs> a friend of mine who was uh, involved in this, he said, because you have different font and it's not, it's not, you're not producing sugar, you should be OK. But well, that, that was the impulse. And it's funny, like, I guess it's so ubiquitous around the country, Domino. That when people pick it up, uh, even people from the other part of the country, they're, oh, sh yeah, that's the sugar label. Mm -hmm. So, anyway, in, already by 1876, a kind of writer said, right, the history of sugar refining in the, we uh, in the Western Hemisphere is completely epitomized in giving the history of the founding, the rise, and growth of the House of Habermeyer and Elder. <coughs> now the largest in the world. So the Habermeyer family right, is really chronicled in the book. Right? So the, the Habermeyers come to America in, seven, in 1799. Right? They end up in, um, in lower Manhattan, right, refining sugar. And then, right, so three generations later, right, uh, Henry Habermeyer, who was known as the sugar king, right, uh, becomes the driving force Right, and builds this refinery that becomes Domino. And it's funny because it's really a story that we don't tell very often, or it's a forgotten story in history. All right. But by 1870, the largest business in New York City, the largest industry, is sugar refining. All right. And for decades, all right, well into the 1920s, it's still the largest industry in Brooklyn. There are thousands and thousands of people right, who are employed in this industry. Uh, so if you were to come to Brooklyn in 1870, uh, there was no Williamsburg Bridge. But if any of you have a sense of where Shaper Landing is, right, down there at about South 5th Street, right, that was a sugar refinery. And sugar refineries uh, covered all of Williamsburg up to about near where Ed's place is to about North 12th Street. And then here on the East River in Greenpoint, where Greenpoint Landing is, there was an 11 story sugar refinery run by a cousin of the Habermeyers. Right? So right, we were the largest area on planet Earth for refining sugar, and the largest refinery in the world right, is the Domino, right? Is the Domino refinery, which is it's not named Domino to about 1920. It's called Habermeyer and Elder. Uh, one other thing that's kind of a sight. So one of the characters in the book is a guy called Patrick McCarran, all right? Which, what did he stick his name on? The park. All right. Basically, we got that park because he bribed everybody in Albany with sugar money. 
Right. And he also got us the Williamsburg Bridge. Uh, again, how did he get it? Right, sugar money. Right. Uh, so McCarran is one of the first corporate lobbyists, lobbyists in American history. Right. Uh, he is shamelessly corrupt. Right. But it, his story's kind of been forgotten, and it's all related to sugar. And one other thing, he worked as a cooper. Does anybody know what coopers make? Barrels. 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 Right. There were two. Right, there were two major industries that ship their products in barrels. What were they? Beer. Well, Not here, all right? Not in this part of Northbrook, right? More like Bushwick. Okay? All right. Well, wooden, uh, wooden barrels? Yeah, wooden uh, barrels. Well, oil. Oil, all right? Before you had steel steel containers for oil, steel drums, it was all sinks. It was all made of wood. And that's part of the reason why our area is so polluted, right? Because these things leaked. Yeah. Right? And sugar. It was all sent out in barrels. Right? Uh, now, one of the things, and it's kind of an aside, right, why we have sugar in paper bags is that there was a coffee company called the Arbuckles. Uh, and the Arbuckles realized that you could also put sugar into, right, into bags. And they started to sell bag sugar. And I think, Lucy, you wrote about this, right? And the, the Habermeyers just... That they were bullies, and they had so much money and so much power. They said uh, to the art buckles, by the way, sell us your, your sugar bagger. And they're like, no, we're not going to do that. And it started this massive, massive war, all right, where they tried to drive the art buckles out, out of power. It, it, they, they weren't able to do it, but, but it went on for years, and millions of dollars were spent all to try to gain access to the sugar bagger. So this is where the Williamsburg Bridge would be today. All right, that's about South South Fifth Street, and this is so the, the whole East River would have looked like this. And one of the things that really made Greenpoint uh, was that many of the people here were either working on tugboats or were working on lighters. Right? Lighters are kind of large barges, and why they had so much work is because there was a massive amount of sugar coming in and out. All right? uh, so on any day, all right, ships would come up to the East River. They would come from Cuba, Puerto Rico, Brazil, Java, and so we have a Java Street here, all right? Egypt, uh, Hawaii. I mean, it was just and this, this massive amount of, of sugar was, was coming in. I I took that shot. Did anybody identify it? Yeah. The sugar bag is very good, right? Which uh, is landmarked, so it can't be destroyed. Uh, much to the chagrin, I guess, of the developers who would love to kind of dynamite it and right send it into oblivion. So it's it's slated to be luxury housing. Uh, I don't know how you turn that building into, into luxury condos, but then again, I'm a writer, not an architect. But I, I think that the, the story of this building's never been properly told, and hopefully this book does it. Uh, you can kind of make out some things in the back. All right, can anybody make out the bridge in the background? What bridge is it? Not Brooklyn Bridge. No. That's the Williamsburg Bridge. And what you're looking at is North Fifth Street. Uh, this is all gone now. There's a park there. All right. This was the third largest rail yard in terms of volume in the United States. It was called Palmer's Dock. And Lowell Palmer was an absolute logistic genius who was able to move this massive amount of sugar in and out. By the way, he became incredibly wealthy doing it. And one of the first things that he, he worked out was, I don't know if you can see it up here, right, is that you could bring rail cars all the way out onto a pier and then load them onto, onto these lighters. And instead of having to deal with one railroad, com railroad company, 
you could sail around all of New York Harbor and pick out any of the 12 uh, railroads that were active in New York City. So basically what they were able to kind of do was, right, to say, you want our business? We have so much business, you have to pay us under the table. You have to pay us kickbacks, right? This went on for many, many years. It was illegal, but, right? And then finally, uh, uh, Henry Havemeyer, who's the kind of main character of the book, and I'll, I'll talk about him, right? Uh, he, he gets in a fight with Lowell Palmer. He follows, he fires Palmer, and then Palmer's right-hand man was an Irishman called Riley. And he also, so he says to Riley, I want dirt on Palmer. And Riley's like, I'm not doing it. I'm not, right? I'm loyal to this guy. So Havemeyer black, blackballs uh, Riley, and then Riley says, oh, maybe I can just go to the federal government and talk about right, your illegal rebates. Right? And this is the beginning of the end of Habermeyer. Right? Uh, yeah. So it's really like in, in, Greek, yeah, in Greek tragedy, hubris, right? Habermeyer becomes so big and so powerful, he begins to think he's above the law. But eventually, he gets taken down. Well, there's old Henry himself. All right. Uh, 1847 and 19, 1917, he just, uh, he saw his 60th birthday. He was one of the richest men in the world. And all of his money was made here. Uh, his grandson wrote uh, a biography of him, and it's a complete whitewash. I mean, if you read his book, you think Grandad is a great guy. All right. If you read my book, you see right, that he was basically a criminal, and he set up a cartel that was every bit as illegal as drug cartels today. Right. Uh, and he net, right for years he didn't get he didn't get prosecuted, but he got greedy and he felt that he was above the law. And I don't want to give too much away, but he started to cheat the gov he started to cheat the government, all right. And it went on for decades, and then finally he gets nailed. How? But, sorry? How? Okay. So what they did is they had they had to pay a duty on these millions of tons of raw sugar that was coming in. And somebody said, well, if you stick a, a ball into the in, into the, the, the weight apparatus, it'll underweigh the sugar and you'll pay less you pay less duty on that. So for years, right? They were they were underpaying on millions of tons of sugar, and then what what they were doing is they were the inspectors the inspectors were getting checks the federal inspectors, and then finally an amazing thing happened. There was an honest federal inspector, and he said, "You guys are cheating, right? I see what you're doing." And the head of the uh, the head of the dock came up to him and said, "Look, name your price." If you'll just forget that you ever saw this, we'll throw it in the river and you'll be a rich man. And what did he say? No. No. And then Theodore Roosevelt, when he found out about it, and Theodore Roosevelt has a kind of an ugly side to foreign policy, but right, he's got, he was really great inside of the country. He says, definitely, right, we're going to prosecute this guy. I don't care how big he is, I don't care how rich, he's been breaking the law and he's going to go to jail. And the stress from knowing that he was going to get prosecuted killed Hadamard. All right? Yeah, good. <laughs> <laughs> All right. A lot of people ask me the question, how did Polish people end up in Greenpoint or North, right, uh, North Brooklyn? And the answer is related to two industries, the oil industry, but principally the sugar industry. And I'll, I'll, I'll read a bit about what it was like to work in the, the sugar refineries. It was hell on earth. Uh, if you can imagine what it would be like to work 12 hours in a sauna, right? But uh, that's more or less what the conditions were like. But you're not just working in a sauna; you're working around very, very dangerous machinery. Uh, the first workers were German. Right? As they Americanized, they said, "Hell no," right? And they specifically picked Polish people uh, because the first immigrants who came to America could not speak English. Right? 
and they, they, they wanted workers who could not tell other people what, how they were being abused, what was, what was happening to them, and literally how they were dying. But, so anyway, in, in 1882, one of the most spectacular fires that we ever had in Brooklyn happens, and it destroys this Habermeyer plant. Okay? Uh, now, if a million today would probably be something like a billion right, in 1882, right. so they had a million and a half dollars in damage from this fire. And right, the Habermeyers said, we got to rebuild. And they took all the family money and rebuilt in a year and a half the largest sugar refinery in the world, the most efficient, the largest. And that's the one that's still there today. So it dates from 1882. But I'm going to stop and I'll read you a little bit about, about the fire. Because it was, it was by all accounts like a, a pretty spectacular, spectacular thing. So, the Habermeyers were well aware of the ever-present danger of fire in the refinery, and the refinery had been fireproofed as much as possible to minimize the risk of fire. Sugar clouds, though, often ignited, causing huge fire. The presence of steam, thousands of moving parts that could right, cause sparks in the refinery, and the highly flammable sugar all made fire a grave risk. For a quarter of a century, they, were, they, they refined huge amounts of sugar without a fire, but their luck would run out this January day. None of the sugar unloaded that morning in the plant would ever make it to market. About three o'clock in the afternoon, Theodore Habermeyer made his customary inspection of the plant and noticed nothing suspicious. Three watchmen, two superintendents, and two assistants remained in the refinery. The night shift was just appearing at four o'clock, when watchman Edward Heyman began to smell smoke and found the flames in the storeroom on the refinery's first floor. Dense smoke quickly filled the room and flames soon leapt from the storeroom. The watchman pulled an alarm that alerted the workers in the plant and also sent a signal to the fire department. About 50 hands on duty at the plant rushed to the refinery, grabbing hoses and attempting to put out the blaze. There were precious minutes of indecision which raised, wasted critical time in finding and turning on water spigots for the hoses. Four engines responded to the first alarm, and four additional companies also answered the second alarm. But 12 minutes had elapsed since the fire was reported. This interval, though it given the, the fire time to spread, the fireboat Habermeyer from Manhattan even appeared on the scene, trying to douse the flames. But all the firefighters' efforts were in vain. The fire moved both upwards and downwards at an alarming speed. Dense masses of potentially flammable vapor poured into the areas where the workers were now using the hoses to douse the blaze. Other workers were removing stacks of records, while some others were trying to wheel out barrels of sugar. However, soon choking fumes reached the area where they were unloading the barrels, and they were left with no choice but to abandon the plant. Outside the plant, the first fire companies quickly deployed, frantically setting up ladders while spreading out hoses. As the firemen and company employees looked up, they realized it was probably already too late. Fueled by tons of sugar, the fire was racing upwards, and flames could already be seen in many of the upper windows. The heat from the fire was so intense that many of the firefighters developed blisters on their faces. Firefighters had to move back from the building's facade due to the amazing heat of the blaze. A number of vats of alcohol blew up, sounding like cannon fire. As the sugar burned, it glowed in a rainbow of colors, the beauty of the flames masking their deadly effectiveness. Chief Smith immediately realized the scope of the blaze and called in a third and fourth alarm as other companies rushed to the scenes. <clears throat> The flames had reached the pan filter rooms, adding coal to the already hot blaze. 
The flames raced upward into the seven stories that faced Kent Avenue. As the flames reached higher and higher, they could now be seen in other neighborhoods. Soon the alarm bells and the short shooting flames attracted crowds of fascinating onlookers. A brilliant glow of flame filled the foggy night sky, which could clearly be seen as far away as Queens and even in northern Manhattan. The firefighters were hampered by a lack of hydrants close to the great refinery. They soon realized that wind had the potential to spread the conflagration to other sugar houses, and there was the real possibility that all Williamsburg could burn down. There was a covered second story bridge connecting the refinery to the boiler house on South 2nd Street that posed a huge danger of allowing the fire to spread. Chief Nevins, who had just arrived on the scene, ordered the bridge taken down, and the firefighters had just commenced cutting the span from the burning building when the burning refinery walls began to sway, signaling the danger. They would soon collapse. A panic ensued, and the firemen instantly abandoned their task, fleeing from the bucking walls. Only a few seconds later, three stories of brick and water mortar came crashing down to the street, severing the bridge, while fortuitously helping the firefighters limit the spread of the flames. Martin Short and the other officers from the precinct arrived to keep the large crowds of onlookers who came to gawk at the blaze away from the danger. A few minutes later, the steam pipes burst, and the hiss of the exploding was loud enough to be heard above the din of the flames. Realizing that the job at hand was to save the new refinery buildings on the other side of the street, Chief Smith and Nevins deployed their men inside and outside the structure across the street. He, set up a team, he sent a team up the winding inner staircase with a long hose and another up the fire escape on the exterior of the building. Both crews did excellent work fighting the fires that threatened to jump the street. Suddenly, a massive section from the top of the old refinery came crashing to, to the ground in the shape of a giant V. Much of the falling material hit the new refinery, engulfing it in flame and threatening to create a second inferno. Then the roof of the old refinery collapsed, and a gush of flame shot up like lava from a spewing volcano. The flames from the burning refinery soared over the top of the ruins, lighting up the river, and there was a lurid beauty to the ghastly spectacle that attracted huge crowds along the Manhattan shoreline, watching spellbound by the blaze. About six o'clock, the remnants of the wall of the old refinery facing Kent Street, which had previously crumbled at the top, buckled and collapsed in a deafening roar as a great cloud of smoke rose up from the street. When the cloud disappeared, onlookers could see the entire in interior of the doomed refinery. The fire burned green, fueled by chemicals that only a short while ago helped refine the sugar. The south wall finally gave way, crumbling to the ground and showering the street with brick. It soon became apparent that the danger of the fire spreading had passed, and the fire would slow slowly burn itself out, consuming the remaining parts of the massive refinery in the process. So. Anyway, uh, this was this a picture of the refinery. It was 13 stories high. It was a huge, huge building. Uh, it's changed. It's, they, they changed over the years. They got rid of those, those things on the top. But so one of the things is, I, I think it's kind of been forgotten, I, how awful it was to work in this in this industry. So this is from the New York Tribune in 1884. It says, the severity of their labors was shown by the fact that they are nearly all thin and stooped and rarely above middle age. It being a well-known fact that men employed in the refineries rarely live to old age. They are nearly all new immigrants, mostly Slavic, right, when first employed. And before work is given them, they must be found perfectly docile and obedient. Then begins a life of perpetual torture. As long as he remains in the finery, and not infrequently, death comes to, quickly to his relief. So a lot of what I do in the book uh, is to describe just how, how awful it was to, uh, 
to work in this refinery. Um, so the plant was refining sugar at a time before the government set regulations to ensure worker safety. Work in the plant was highly dangerous for the 3,000 or so workers who toiled there. Workers could be killed or injured in a variety of ways, and there was no system of workers' compensation. So if you got hurt, right, you were, right, you were just given a pink slip, and that was it. They did nothing for you, and people were hurt all the time. Untested machinery often led to explosions that caused horrific injuries or even fatalities. Workers could be scalded by steam, or a falling elevator could crush them. Workers could impale themselves by falling on a hook, or they could get pinned under a falling sugar bag. They could also fall off the slippery catwalks or get caught by machines like George Habermeyer. And let me just, just stop. So earlier in the book, one of the things is there were four Habermeyer brothers uh, who were destined to inherit this business. The oldest one was George, who desperately wanted to go off and fight in the Civil War. And his father said, what the hell is wrong with you? We're buying you a replacement for $300. Right? We don't give a damn about this war. We don't give a damn about patriotism. We're, right? You're going to become a rich man. You're going to learn this business. And then, horrifically, uh, the, the, the oldest son was killed in an accident before the father's eyes. Right? He got caught into the machinery. It dragged him in, and then he was thrown down, and the father came down, and his, his son's crushed body was there. The father even it never quite recovered from that. But his, his two other brothers took over and continued, continued the refinery. But sugar dust also hurt the workers' health. Breathing the dust over 70 hours a week called, caused lung ailments, and many of the workers developed chronic coughs and had trouble breathing. The dust also produced skin rashes that sometimes covered the worker's almost totally exposed body. Because the temperatures were at a minimum 100 degrees, and in some places it was 130 degrees, these guys wore, basically wore loincloths, and that was it. And my friend Ed Raven here is here. He's, this is not a pitch for beer, but one of the things that they did is because Literally, you would sweat out so much that uh, they gave them beer at cost. Now, you can imagine what, what happens, though. So you're, you're, right, you're working a 12-hour shift in these conditions. Right? You're drinking beer, and you're around dangerous machinery. So what do you think is going to happen? Injuries, right? And, or fatalities. And, so, even if a sugar worker didn't fall victim to the many kind of accidents that was stable in, the constant exposure to the intense heat of the plant might destroy him. The sauna-like temperatures quickly wrecked strong men who went into the plant. Outsiders could recognize sugar workers because of their gauntness and pallid skin tone. Sugar workers quickly appeared physically drained and prematurely aged. To help the workers replenish the huge amounts of salt the sugar work workers sweated out on their 12-hour shifts. The firm served beer at cost, charging the workers a penny for a pound of beer. Good price, right? <laughs> Management arranged to have the beer brought into the refinery several times a day from a local brewery. But I guess that was before, right? You were around. Right? Right. Uh, it's little wonder that the saloon surrounding the plant did a huge business or that heat-exhausted workers drank excessively. Often the men spent large amounts of their meager, meager wages overindulging in beer, bringing hardship on their dependent families who relied on them for their basic necessities of life. And I just want to stop and give you an aside. So one of the kind of ideas in the book is that all different levels of society turned a blind eye to what was happening in this refinery. And one of the, the people who really could have spoken out, should have spoken out, was the, the head of the local Catholic church, which was on South 2nd Street. It's sadly been torn down in the last year. Uh, but it was literally inside of the refinery. And it was a Father Malone, uh, who was very, very good friends with the Habermas. Right? Father Malone could have defended the sugar workers in his congregation, but he didn't. 
He was especially critical of men who drank to excess. I blame the drinking workers for their poverty, for the poverty many families experience. Perhaps his close friendship with Theodor Habermeyer and his wife, to whom he was confessor, colored his view of the Habermeyer treatment of their employees. The pastor also might have been influenced by the huge gift of $35,000. Theodor Habermeyer gave Father Malone four years previously when he visited Ireland. When asked about the possibility of a strike, Father Malone said that the workers should be grateful for their employment in the refinery. And he had uttered not even one word in criticism of Habermeyer and Hilda. Now, in the 1880s, $35,000 was a massive amount of money. Uh, like, to kind of give you a, 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 a frame of reference, so these guys made about $8 a, $8 a week, so about $400 a year. So it gives you a kind of a sense of, of, of what a gift this was. And it just definitely brought this man silence. He never, ever, ever said a word against the, against the Habermeyers. Hmm. All right. I, I said before that uh, they, they tried to, uh, oh, they, they really tried to pick people who were docile, who would put up with this. But this is also kind of really important. On scorching days, Hundreds of sugar workers were driven to the verge of insanity. On searing 12-hour long days, some firemen, driven to insanity by shoveling coal in extreme heat and humidity, threw themselves into the East River from the top of the factory. During these hellish days, hundreds of workers succumbed to the heat, often passing out at their station. On one particularly hot day, there were eight heat-related deaths. On another scorching day, more than 600 fell prostrate from the heat. On another occasion, a third of the entire refinery workforce, some 400 workers, fainted with the heat. Because passing out on hot days was so common, the refinery set up an ambulance system to bring prostrate workers to the local hospital. But sometimes, treatment came too late. And by the way, they never, ever, ever right, closed the plant even if it was 100 degrees outside. And they knew that men were going to die. They, still, they, had, they had no mercy. Yeah. So basically, it's, it's kind of summing up with you know, the horrible conditions that they worked in. I, you can, you can kind of make out. Does anybody know what what, what street it is? It's South Third. It's it's not in Greenpoint, by the way. It's not mm. Williamsburg. Yeah, South Third, no? Yeah. Mm. Right. And those uh, these bridges are gone, but they connected the different the different parts of the refinery. Uh, and but uh, people lived in in these, cro these crowded tenements with without running water with outhouses, uh, and I started to do research. The population density of these places blew me away, because it was very common to have 10 kids. Yeah. And you would have 10 kids in what would be the equivalent of, of a two-bedroom apartment. Yeah. If you ever have a chance, go to the tenement museum. It's, it's really a pretty amazing experience. Right. Right. So obviously, you have people living without running water, right. without sanitation, cholera was, was a problem. Right. Uh, people died like flies. Uh, so finally, uh, the new refinery is rebuilt right, in right, late 1883. Right. The Habermeyers are making, making tremendous amounts of money. And finally, the workers say, we've got, we've got to strike. So in 1886, the sugar workers tried to organize a union. And um, basically, all of the refineries, thousands of men all along the East River, right, went out on strike. Right? Now, they were paid between $1.35 and $1.45 a day, while the Havemeyers were making a million or two million dollars a month. So the men went out on strike for 12 cents more a day. And the Havemeyers said, no way. 
right? And all the sugar, uh, the, the sugar refinery owners got together in a secret meeting and they said, look, these guys are poor, they have large families, right? We can shut, we can shut down and we can drive them to their knees, which they did. But what, because these men were so desperate, uh, there, was, right, there was real violence. Uh, and you, you, can't, you can't really blame them. Uh, so uh, the newspapers all focused on the violence of the strikers and the widespread influence of communist agitators, while they generally ne neglected the grievance of the workers. In one of the few admissions that the workers had any legitimate grievances, the Brooklyn Daily Eagle quoted a Republican strike witness who reflected the xenophobia inherent in the newspaper's coverage, saying, I'm sure that the sugar men have been underpaid. I sympathize with them. But I hold that American citizens are the only ones who dictate as to American prices. If men make trouble on First Street or anywhere else, let the police ask them for their citizens' papers. If they fail to show them, I hold that the authorities can send them back to their own country, just as they have the right to send back pauper immigrants to, from Castle Gardens. This is not a country that can be ruled by aliens. Sound familiar? Yeah. <laughs> right. So, in 1887, there was too much sugar being produced. Uh, the price was going down, profits were going down. So, Henry Habermeyer's lawyer was a guy called John Searles, and he said, you want to form a trust. So basically what a trust is, all the heads of the sugar refineries got together and said, we will limit how much sugar we make, and we're going to jack up the price. Uh, and they bought out some of the unproductive refineries. They started making them. It was completely illegal, and it went on for... Uh, for decades. Now, New York State said it was illegal, right? The New York State Supreme Court. Fine, what did they do? They moved to New Jersey, they reincorporated, right? And kept on, right? Kept on in business. And they made ungodly amounts of money. And remember, these are the days before income tax, right? Uh, so, all right, in one year, Habermeyer made $55 million. And Bastards wouldn't give their workers 18 cents an hour, though they were killing them. And of course, right, you can't get away with this without having power in Washington. Now, uh, that's Henry in the background, and that is Grover Cleveland. And I don't know if you can make out what he's what he's writing here. I don't know if you can, you can make out. So the, the, the tax on, on raw sugar, which was before income tax was approved, the government made its money by tariffs. Right? Uh, so as, they, as the Senate was discussing the, the tariff, Habermeyer came down right, and he said, look guys, I gave you a lot of money. All right? When you needed to win the election, it was my money that helped you. And the Secretary of Commerce, right, who was a personal friend of Habermeyer's, he said, look, I'll tell you what, I, what, what tariffs to write. You just write down what I say. All right? And literally, he took notes from Habermeyer. Right? Habermeyer went out and uh, told the senators who were going to vote on this, oh, by the way, if you buy stock in my company and then vote and give me good, right, good rates on raw sugar, good, right, the value of the stock will go up and you will make a killing. And a lot of them did just that. I mean, it was, it was breathtakingly corrupt. Right. And what's, influ what's interesting is, right, I mean, when I wrote the Greenpoint book, uh, I mean, Greenpoint doesn't have a massive influence on American history. I mean, it, the Charles Evans Hughes, or he was a, a figure on a national level. But what's really interesting is that the refineries in Williamsburg had a huge influence on Cuba and Puerto Rico. Right? The largest source of sugar coming into Williamsburg was Cuba. And for years I studied the Spanish-American War and it just didn't seem to make sense. 
I couldn't understand why America would want to, you know, was that interested in these islands. And then when I did this research, it all clicked. It was the Spanish controlled right, the sugar plantations. And Habermeyer wanted to get them away from them. Right? So, right, a lot of people refer to right, the Spanish American War as Habermeyer's War. By the way, as soon as they get right, Cuba and Puerto Rico under American flag, one of the first things they do is they set up an infrastructure, not to help the Puerto Ricans or the Cubans, it's to export their sugar. And then Habermeyer buys all the refineries, right? So they had domination on three levels. They dominated the raw sugar product, right? They dominated the production of it, and then the marketing of it. It's complete, uh, complete monopoly. Uh, so we kind, of, we kind of alluded to this before. Eventually, he gets caught. All right. uh, he finds out that he's, he's going to get prosecuted. And this eventually stresses him out to the point that he... Who gets caught? Okay, so uh, Habermeyer knew about it. All right. So what happened is this honest federal inspector came to the docks, saw that they were cheating when they weighed the sugar. Yeah. And despite the fact that he was offered a massive bribe, yeah. all right, he reported it and Roosevelt said yes. We're going to we're going to prosecute Habermeyer. So Habermeyer knew he was going to get prosecuted, mm -hmm. and that the stress to that brought him to an early grave. Good. <laughs> All right. That is Patrick McCarran, right? Who was called the Sugar Senator. Uh, Patrick McCarran, uh, they say, gambled over a million dollars a year. He was a lot of people say he was the largest gambler in the history of New York State. Uh, what's amazing is, as a state senator in Albany, he was paid $3 a day. So, I mean, it's the obvious question is, how would you get the money to gamble a million dollars a year on a salary of $3? Well, the answer is, right, he, he was the first corporate lobbyist for the oil industry and the sugar industry. Right. And a lot of the book talks about his rise uh, so he's born in 1847 on Drake's, right? Comes, uh, he starts as a, as a cooper making barrels. He's very ambitious, gets into politics, and then just shamelessly sells out the people in the neighborhood uh, to represent them. And I think it's going to come up on, on Greenpoint as I wrote a little story. So, how, uh, McCarran was so sure that he was going to get reelected, he wanted to make it look like there was some kind of opposition to him, and the Republicans said, ah, you know, we're not even going to nominate somebody. So he went to a local bartender and he said, look, why don't you run against me? The guy said, would it cost money? He said, don't worry, I'll, I'll, pay your, I'll pay your bills, and I'll even tell a few of my people to vote for him. And what happened is that, that people realized how, how corrupt McCarran was, and in probably the greatest shock in North Brooklyn history, this bartender was elected state senator, and he defeated yeah. he defeated McCarran. And he, his friends woke him up in the morning. He's like, "Why are you waking me up? I, I need to sleep." He said, "You didn't hear? You got elected." Mm -hmm. All right. Two years later, McCarran was back in power. Why? Because he called in all the sh all, all the favors that he was owed. Right. He bribed a lot of people. Right. And the last thing was. A lot of people realized that the only way they were going to get the Williamsburg Bridge was McCarran. And right, he might have been a corrupt politician, but he was, he was effective. Uh, this is the second wife of Henry Habermeyer. The, he was married to a woman. They had a disastrous marriage. He divorced, and I can't kind of sense. He marries his own, he, he marries his wife's niece, uh, which is... No, that's kind of creepy. Uh, but she, Louisine Habermeyer, had an amazing life of art. And before she ever met him, she became the first American to buy a Monet, and she became the first American to buy a Degas. Right? Uh, she was ra she was raised in Paris. Uh, her her kind of mentor was a woman called Mary Cassatt, who was an American Impressionist. And then when she had this incredible amount of sugar money to buy art with, 
they made the Metropolitan the great museum that it is. Uh, if you, they had a house that tragically was torn down, but I also talk a little bit about this beautiful house they had on 66th Street and 5th Avenue. Uh, and they had one room that was called the Rembrandt Room. There were eight Rembrandts in the house. And they said when you visited the Heimermeyer house, they had better art than any American museum in the late 1880s. Uh, finally, she lasts to look into the 1920s, and then when she dies, they bequeath more than a thousand paintings to the Metropolitan. Most of the great impressionism, right, that's in the Met, is because of her. So, I mean, they might have been horrible people on one hand, but well, they had good taste in art. <laughs> you know, you... That's an, another one of... Uh, Another one of her, her paintings that she wore. Uh, so I, I do more than just sort of talk about sugar. I also sort of talk about uh, the development of Williamsburg from uh, 1844 to 1909 when Habermeyer dies. And this is kind of another forgotten figure. Uh, they reckon that there are seven boxers in the history of boxing who've never been defeated in the ring. Well, one of them was an Irish guy from Williamsburg. Uh, who started out as a cooper making barrels on North 5th Street. Uh, his name is Jack McAuliffe. And I love this story. So McAuliffe was, he was born in Ireland, brought to Bangor, Maine as a child, and then showed up in Williamsburg about age 12 or 13. So the kids would send out other kids and just say, who are you? Who are you? And he would, he would give them a bloody lip or a bloody nose. And he said, go back to the toughest kid in the neighborhood and tell him, I'm the ruler now. So eventually the toughest kid in the neighborhood fought out and fought and called it. For seven nights, right, they, they fought under a street lamp. And then on the eighth night, the kid didn't show up and McCulloch was the champion of Williamsburg. And years later, he said, that kid in Williamsburg was a lot tougher than some uh, professional boxers that I, I fought against. But it's kind of a, a, a forgotten story. And then I mentioned Father Malone. Uh, so Father Malone was, was around for about 50 years. And his, his parish was at South 2nd Street. And sadly, like I mentioned, in the last year it was destroyed. But this is also a kind of a forgotten part of, of neighborhood history. Uh, in the 1850s, the church was almost burned by nativists. So nativists were Americans who did not welcome uh, principally Catholics. If you've all seen the film The, film, the Gangs of New York, mm -hmm. Bill the Butcher, mm -hmm. right? Uh, Bill the Butcher led a group of, of nativists across from Manhattan, and they tried to, uh, they tried to burn this church. So this was really, it's, it's again kind of forgotten, but I'm just going to describe what the neighborhood was like and what the religious animosity was like in the, in the 1850s. So, in 1853, a riot erupted in Williamsburg between the nativists and the Irish. And right, the Irish were, it's funny because there's a book called How the Irish Became White. And really, it's this idea that now they're part of the mainstream. But it's, the Irish have, have kind of forgotten how despised they were when they came here. Right? So two nativists who were beaten in an altercation with six Irishmen returned to the scene of the fight with an angry nativist mob. When the Irishmen made their escape into Peter Quinn's porterhouse on Grand Street, the mob decided to break in and even the score. They began to batter down the door with stones, <coughs> while the policemen who showed up at the scene at first were powerless to quell the violence. The mob quickly succeeded in prying the door open, heaving paving stones into the room, some weighing 10 or 12 pounds. Mrs. Quinn was struck in the left, left side with a stone and hurt badly. Mr. Quinn was also seriously injured when he was hit in the chest by a heavy stone. The nativists shattered a large mirror standing at the back of the bar with stones. Quinn, in desperation, grabbed a shotgun, firing in the air to scare the mob, but with no effect. The mob made another rush for the door with knives, cart rungs, and stones, but were stopped by the policemen who, were not, who now blocked the doorway determined to keep them back. Captain Hunt of the 2nd Ward squad finally arrived with a group of reinforcements, putting an end to the disturbance and probably preventing the loss of life. 
as the Irishmen in the house had armed themselves with four muskets ready to shoot. Such violence repeated itself with alarming regularity, and soon the violence helped turn Williamsburg into one of the strongholds of the American party, much the resentment of the local Irish who were ready to use violence to stop nativists from voting against them. The American party ran a slate of candidates for office in 1854 against the immigrants and threatened to unleash further violence. Father Malone could have been a, a, a voice of reason, but he'd been called to Rome before the vote, so he was not present to, it was not present to calm his congregants and diffuse the anger. Violence would soon rear its ugly head. On election day, a group of 400 Irishmen loitering outside a polling station on Grand Street were intent on confronting American Party voters. When a poll worker, believed to have need of his sympathies, challenged Irish votes, the long-feared riot broke out. The poll worker, a man called Silkworth, was br brutally beaten by the angry mob. Police attempted in vain to clear the streets, but were overwhelmed by the mob, now suddenly armed with clubs, shovels, and hoes. A volunteer fireman and deputy sheriff named Har Harrison was passing by when he came to the aid of, Sil of Silkworth. Harrison was beaten so severely with a club that he died. Two other men had their skulls broken, but survived. Harrison's death at the hands of an Irish mob sparked anger and calls for revenge. When it was learned that the victim was a volunteer fireman, Bill the Bitcher Poole called for his followers amongst nativist fire companies to sail over to Williamsburg and exact revenge. Harrison's funeral was to be held locally at Engine Company No. 8. The funeral was planned to be a huge occasion with all the firehouses in the city sending delegations, increasing the likelihood of violence. Everyone feared November 8th would be a day of bloodshed. Hundreds of Manhattan nativists, many of them volunteer firemen, dressed in black armbands, boarded the Williamsburg ferries, bent on revenge. They masked on the Williamsburg shoreline, shouting out in unison to the church, preparing to burn Father Malone's church to the ground. As they headed up Grand Street, they were met by a group of armed Irishmen, and a riot ensued. The Irishmen, armed with clubs and bricks, fought the similarly armed nativists, but the torch-wielding nativist mob was too large to contain, and 200 of them breached the Irish defenses and reached the Catholic Church at, Sa at South 2nd Street, ready to set it alight. Armed parishioners with rifles had just managed to lock the gates, moving inside the building and loading their weapons, preparing to fight and die in defense of their house of worship. The angry mob shook the gate so violently that the cross welded to its top came crashing down, much to the delight of the baying mob. The mob hurled stones through the windows, breaking the stained glass. The church seemed doomed. Suddenly, the mayor of Williamsburg, William Wall, bravely pushed his way through the menacing mob, addressing them, and amazingly, they allowed him to speak. He warned them that the militia was on the way and would shoot anyone on sight attacking the church. He also promised that the men who had killed Harrison would be brought to justice. His bravery and the threat that the militia would shoot miraculously avoided violence. When three companies of armed militia formed up and took aim at the rioters, the angry mob backed away from the church. The avoidance of bloodshed and the survival of the church seemed an act of divine intervention. And yet, I think if you were to ask a lot of Irish Catholics, they would have no, no knowledge that there was ever that history, right? That, you know, Catholic churches were, there was one in Manhattan that was burned. Luckily, the church here was, was not burned. But that was the level of, of, of animosity. Uh, I'm going to finish up and then I'll, I'll take questions. But one of the cool things that I found when I did research was that Williamsburg had a, a very, very strong black community that was involved in abolitionism. Uh, they were involved in the Underground Railway. Uh, and this man, Willis Hodges, who lived on South Fifth Street, uh, was the first black man to publish an abolitionist newspaper. Uh, and what I do when I, when I write history is I don't, fiction, I don't fictionalize things, but I try to make it a story. So 
William Willis Hodges was a really fascinating character. There were not many free blacks in Virginia, but his family were free blacks, and they, they, they had enough <coughs> money that they were able to buy to buy land in Virginia. And he was a contemporary of Nat Turner, right? Nat Turner was, led a slave revolt. Mm -hmm. His brother was uh, charged in a, in a trumped up charge uh, as an accomplice of, of Nat Turner. His brother ran away to Williamsburg. He stayed, and this this story stayed with him all of his life. Uh, so it was. Uh, by the way, he was a. Uh, of a, a contemporary of, of John Brown, you know, who was hanged at Harper's Ferry. And John Brown wanted the Williamsburg black community to come down to Harper's Ferry and fight with him. He decided not to, but this would, this would kind of give you a, a sense of why he was uh, an abolitionist. All right. So uh, I imagine that he had a dream, but the, the incident really took place. So, in his dream, he was again a 13-year-old boy behind the plow in Virginia and a mule in the field surrounding the family house, where he made out a large group of maybe a hundred white riders emerging from the woods, galloping full speed to the family farm. The Hodges family was a rarity in Antebellum, Virginia. They were prosperous, free black landowners who were now being targeted because Willis's brother, William, 12 years old, older, had escaped from jail after being arrested on the groundless charge of abetting a slave rebellion. Willis ran through the fields as fast as he could in hopes of warning his mother, but he was too far from the house and the men on horseback approached too rapidly. His father was away from the farm, leaving Willis as the sole male on the place. He arrived at the house just after the group of horsemen had, him, had dismounted. He tried to run to his mother, but several ar armed white men prevented him from entering the kitchen where his mother was cooking. He again tried to push into the kitchen, but the white men still pushed the small teenager roughly back. In his dream, he recalled how one of the group's leaders, Benjamin Woodward, stood menacing in the family kitchen and began insulting his mother, calling her a damn nigger bitch, before noticing the watch and fine chain that hung around her neck. Something unusual for a white woman and very rare for a black woman, a clear sign of the Hodges family wealth. There were five or six other men in the room with Woodward who began to speak to, Miss, uh, to Willis's mother again. You look very handsome with a watch and chain. Give it here now, bitch. His mother was a proud woman, and instead of giving Woodward the watch and chain, she picked up a hickory walking stick, a gift of her husband, quickly giving Woodward two or three quick hard blows to the face, which drew blood from his nose infuriating the white intruder while rousing the other men in the room into action. They grabbed her, pulled the stick away from her, and held her arms down, while Woodward angrily threatened, You'll pay for this. Hodges tried to break free and enter the kitchen, but was still restrained at the door and made to witness the awful scene that followed. Woodward pinned his mother to the floor and with his thumb began to gouge out his mother's eyes. She screamed at the top of her lungs, don't let them put my eyes out. Woodward continued ground gouging with sadistic pleasure while the woman's right eye protruded from the socket with blood streaming down her face. Then Woodward spotted Willis in the doorway and stopped gouging out his mother's eyes. Woodward walked over to him, grabbing him by the shoulder, pulling out a pistol as he began pushing into the yard. He stopped about 15 paces from the kitchen, put the gun to his head and said, Tell me where your brother is, or I'll kill you. Hodges recalled thinking he'd rather he'd sooner die than reveal any uh, information to this hated white man. He said nothing and felt a stream of sweat running down his face while also feeling the cold metal barrel of the gun against the side of his head. Then he heard the click of the weapon's hammer being pulled back as, men as Woodward menacingly repeated his threat to kill him if he didn't talk. Hodges closed his eyes, not sure if he'd ever open them again. Hodges recalled the panic and helplessness that he felt. Then he recalled hearing the loud bang of the pistol, sure that he was dead, 
But when he opened his eyes, he saw that one of the family dogs, which had run up to protect him, lay dying on the ground, a pool of blood running from his head. Woodward pistol whipped him with a weapon, and he was, uh, he was knocked to the ground with a hard blow to the head. Woodward then gave the group of mounted white men the order to shoot all the animals. Hodges again heard the firing of several weapons and saw to his horror, within a, few, within a minute, all the family dogs, cattle, pigs, and chickens lying slaughtered in the barnyard. It was that day that Hodges made the deep vow that would serve as a catalyst for his actions and motivate him for the rest of his, of his days. Hodges swore eternal war against slavery, vowing to avenge the wrongs committed against his mother. And then he ended up in Williamsburg. So I'll stop there. I don't know if you, if you have any questions. And then after, I would be like totally grateful. Uh, if you wanted to, to buy a book, or that would, be, that would really be, make me very happy. Does anybody have any questions? Hopefully I can, I can answer them. So how does the domination of the sugar industry continue to this day? Because there's still, it's still sort of a monopoly on the sugar in refinery in the U.S. as opposed to cheaper productions elsewhere. Or, so what, what happens is, I would say it's a lot less domination than back in the day. So they control 98% right. of the sugar production. Right. And then at some point, long after Habermeyer was dead, right. the government finally said to them, you have a monopoly, you have to break it up. Right. So there's no company that has that kind of dominance. But still, there's a certain, I mean, there's protectionism still. Oh, absolutely. Oh, and, and it all goes back to what Habermeyer did. See, they right. they pay the politicians, right. and then the politicians like you know watch out for them. Right. So it yeah, but it's it's not at the scale it was then. Right. I mean they they literally control the whole sugar production. Right. But Jeffrey, seventy five percent of our sugar on the eastern seaboard comes from one family in the Dominican Republic, so it continues to this day. So protectionism is there, yes. Okay, you, and in terms of, of, of raw sugar, we, I think we were, at least what I understood was we were talking about refining. So how does it happen that, okay, so New York is a port city, so how is it that the refining all ended up here? As so what you want to do is you want to refine the sugar as close to where it comes in as possible. Uh, so in, the, in 1858, Right. They move from Manhattan and build a, right, build a plant in Williamsburg. Why Williamsburg? Right. Yeah. The land was a lot cheaper. It was one of the few places left in New York where you, you, you had enough space yeah. to build right, a, the, the large amount of, of building that you need to refine sugar. And the idea was that you could refine the sugar 30 steps from where it came off the boat. Mm -hmm. okay. So all of, the, all of those factors come together to make this the most profitable place to refine sugar. Manhattan was just too expensive. Mm -hmm. So the first refineries were there, but by the 1850s, you, you just can't buy ground as cheaply as you can at Williamsburg. Mm -hmm. But not, it didn't wind up in Philadelphia or anywhere else? Oh, yeah, so there were, right, there were some places, there were some refineries in, in Philadelphia, and I actually go into it in the book, but basically what the Sugar Trust did is they, they bought up this refinery and closed it. So when competition would come, right, they would do one or two things. The one, they would try to like, lower the price, sell it a loss, to drive that company out, or then they eventually would just buy, they, they would buy them out. The problem with Philadelphia is it doesn't have the harbor that it does here. So it's harder to bring in the, the amount of sugar, mm -hmm. right? Uh, but the river there, is, it's not really suitable for really deep draft vessels. So that's why, I mean, we have, I think it's the largest natural harbor in the world. And that's a lot of the reason why this becomes such an area for sugar refining and oil refining. Mm -hmm. How does the sugar actually arrive in the tips? What all what does that mean? Is it like cane? Is it I, I go sorry? into this in the book. So one of the things that when you cut the sugar cane, if you don't do anything, it's going to quickly ferment. So they, they already in Cuba or Puerto Rico, they began to process it. it it's, it's boiled, right? chemicals are added to it. And basically, it, uh, it's, it forms a, a brown sort of, of sugar. It's put into a hogshead, 
and it's shipped as, as raw sugar to Brooklyn where it's it's refined. Is by, it molasses? Sorry? Is it molasses, molasses or Bristol? Well, okay, molasses is, is a byproduct of right of, mm -hmm. of taking the, the raw sugar from the cane, mm -hmm. right, and turning it into brown sugar. So when it came half processed, was it in crystal solid form or? It was in a solid form, right? Like lumps. Yeah. 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 And then I kind of, you can actually read about this all in the book. So it's it's this huge process where they would pump it all the way up to the top of the uh, the eleventh story of this refinery, and then it worked it worked its way down, and by the end it was white refined mm -hmm. sugar. Are we talking about the Dunham Sugar Factory building? Which one of them? Yeah, I mean that's the principal one, but there are twelve different refineries in this area, wow. and they're all sort of as part of this cartel that that Habermeyer sets up <coughs> to jack up the price of sugar. There's also something later called beet sugar, right? Mm -hmm. And right, it starts in the West and it's profitable. So what does Habermeyer do? Right? He goes out there, sells his sugar at below cost. Drives all the beet sugar men out of out of business, and then buys up the beet sugar. So it seems like there were no women working at the Domino Sugar Plant. I think there were there were there were some uh, like doing clerical work and maybe a few doing packing. The thing was the men worked almost naked. Right. Uh, <laughs> That the heat was was searing. I mean, it literally could kill these men. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I, I, men or women, you didn't last very long. Probably it would, it would just broken the health of. Okay. okay, I'm asking because um, the family lore in my family is that my Polish grandmother worked at the Domino Sugar Plant, and but not long, not her whole life, just right. her early life before she got married and moved away. Yeah. Uh, so I'm. I guess she must have been maybe a packer. Yeah, all right. So there were packers, there were clerical people, but the, inside the factory there was almost exclusively men and largely like Polish and Slovakian men. Mm -hmm. By the way, they were not referred to by the names, they were numbers. Like you, so you went into work, you were number 1013, all right, you didn't even get a name. Yes? How did they get the name Domino? So, uh, about 1920, they they just they picked the name Domino. It was called right, it, it, it previously Habermeyer and Elder, and then they had Eagle Brand, and they just I think it was it sounded nice. So it's it's after Henry Habermeyer is dead, but not 1920 they changed that. Were any of the owner families based in this area, or were they all over in the city? Uh, so they had, uh, many of them had started as merchants in Williamsburg. They were largely German Americans, uh, but as they made money, nobody really wanted to stay here. I mean, you wanted, you, know, you had money, you wanted to be in Manhattan. So yeah, they, they, uh, uh, a few of them were were merchants in Williamsburg, but as soon as they started to cash in, they moved over there. So Heidelmeier was was born on in, in, just off Fourteenth Street. Right? But he was here all the time. And what's interesting is, it, in the German system, uh, uh, you learn by starting on the shop floor. So both the Habermeyer brothers started on the shop floor and knew every aspect of the business. Mm -hmm. So Habermeyer started at 13. And by the time he was 21, he was ready to, to be this ruthless CEO. Yeah. So you mentioned. Uh, all this corruption and um, the fact that most of it, most of the story takes place before uh, 1913, or the, the income tax. Um, were any of those later Adam uh caught up in income tax and tax fraud or anything? Any other degrees of fraud? It's, it's interesting. So after Habermeyer dies, they start to to look at what he what he's done. And one of the things is, you know, you can't just if you're in a corporation, you can't just get stock. Right, you've got to you've got to give consideration for it. It's got to be it's got to be legal record. So they found out that Habermeyer took a hundred million dollars of stock and just said it's mine. So his son lost that because it was totally illegal. You can't do that. Right, uh, but that I mean there's there's been money in the Habermeyer family for generations because it was unbelievable wealth. 
So his uh, his son was involved in his his grandsons were involved in the sugar business. Um, they also set up museums and they were extremely wealthy people. But the grandson wrote a book about his grandfather, about Henry Havemeyer, and it's complete whitewash. And he just never mentions any of the, the, the corrupt things that his grandfather did. When was that published? In the 80s. Have you 